Well, um, we're going to study tonight, as we have been studying, the Old Testament tabernacle. And we learned um, last week, we began studying the, the Old Testament tabernacle. And we, we, we learned that, you know, how that God... But for, well, first of all, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Amen. You know, and I remember, you know, when I started studying my Bible, I would hear different people say, well, you know, this part of the Bible was just for the early church. And God doesn't do, you know, miracles anymore. That was just for them. And then they'll say, well, the Old Testament, you know, that was just for the Jews. And, you know, and, and by the time they got through cutting the Bible to pieces, I was like, well, Lord, what did you leave for me? What is there there for me? <laughs> Just a few scraps, apparently. Until one day, I discovered 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And I found that all Scripture, all of it, from Genesis to Revelation, is profitable for me. Is, is, is For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction in righteousness. So that everything in this Bible is there with a purpose. It is there with intention. There is something to be profited from every word. Even the punctuation marks are profitable to me. Amen. So but we, we learned as we were studying that the, you know, the Bible, the author, rather God, who is the author of the Bible, dedicated three chapters in His Word, three chapters, to the creation of the world and to the, uh, the origin of the, of the universe. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We know the story. Three chapters, and He's done. And then we learned that He dedicated 50 chapters to the Old Testament tabernacle. Now that's a lot of real estate to, to dedicate to something that has little to no value to me today as a Christian. That's a lot of, that's a lot of chapters in there. But if I believe 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all Scripture is profitable, then I've got to understand that all of those 50 chapters where he goes into the minutia of the tabernacle, and men, you know, how many of you have ever tried to read that portion of the Word? It's kind of hard to read, right? Let's be honest. It's, you know, and the gate and the hanging of the gate was of silver and the bar was of brass and the, the, the linen and the curtains and the 50 cubits by 5 cubits and 2 cubits. And you think, what does all this, what is this here for? Until we understand, like Paul said over in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, the Apostle Paul writes, in verse 8, and he says, The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. He's talking about Moses' tabernacle. The tabernacle that Moses made in the wilderness. You see, when Moses came down off the mountain, he came down with the, the, the two tables of stone, but he also had a divine blueprint that God had given him to make a tabernacle. And we learned last week, God told Moses four times, uh, at least four times, He said, see that you make this tabernacle exactly according to the pattern that I showed you in the mount. Why? In other words, He was telling him, don't embellish. Make it exactly the way I told you to make it. Because it was a picture, it is a picture, of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And so Moses would have embellished, then the picture would have been destroyed. 
And God wanted us to see Jesus in that tabernacle. So he says, the, the Holy, Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. He said, so that tabernacle that Moses built in the wilderness was a figure, it was a shadow, it was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Verse 11, but Christ being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. And we have the word building, but it's actually the word in both Greek and some other English translations is not of this creation. Amen. So he was, he was, he's saying here, he's telling us, this is the key to understanding those 50 chapters where he's going into all of this detail as to what the meaning of all that is, is that it is all, every bit of it, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the more we delve into the intricacies of the tabernacle, and you'll find that it is, it is one of the, mo the richest portions of the Word of God. Because the whole thing is describing Jesus to us. So let me ask you, who is the central theme of all Scripture? Jesus. See, that's the, if you don't know the answer in this class, just say Jesus. If you just say Jesus, you got a probably a 98% chance of getting it right. The tabernacle is all about Jesus and describing Him and His beauty. And then all of your 66 books of your Bible are all about Jesus. Let, let me give you a little secret. When you understand this tabernacle, there are lots of portions of your Bible that will start to pop and unfold, and you're going, oh, so that's what he was talking That's what that means. That was the reference. That's what he's talking about. It begins to unfold in infinite, beautiful detail. For instance, one of the things I like to refer to a lot when I'm when I'm, you know, studying this that if you study the book of Revelation, all seven pieces of furniture in this tabernacle are mentioned in the book of Revelation. So there's a lot that you may not quite fully grasp and 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 how could we ever fully grasp anything because the word of god is infinite there is no way there the day you say well that's it i've learned everything about that scripture well that's the <laughs> that's the day you've messed up <laughs> because there is always something deeper higher and broader to learn from the word of god <clears throat> but all the, of these seven pieces of furniture are mentioned in the book of revelation praise god Thank you, Lord. So today, we're going to go to the tabernacle, but before I do, I want to introduce a little a, a principle to you that I think is going to be helpful as we study, okay? And it is, the, it, it is called, it's a little principle that I like to call nature versus power. Nature versus power. Because why are we to study? Why should we study the Word of God and, and to see, ma'am? Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Exactly. That's right. You see, you, you, well, she's a quick learner. Amen. I hope I can do as well when I take your class. <laughs> Nature versus power. We study the Word of God. We pray. We seek Him. We deny ourselves. 
we pursue, we go after Him. We give of our time and of our resources, of our money and just everything that we can. All of the things we do are with the pursuit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we to be pursuing His power or His nature? Yes, His nature. Isaiah 14. And He says, I'll start in verse 11. He says, Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now, I'm, I'm just going to pause. Why was Lucifer so interested in the north? You ever stop and think about that? So I want to take control in the north. 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, he wanted to be like the Most High. In his power or in his nature? Which one? His power. Lucifer didn't care one bit about acquiring the nature of God. He didn't care at all. The only thing he wanted was God's power. I will ascend. I will sit in the congregation in the sides of the north. I will, I will, I will, I will. <laughs> and the minute we start saying, I will, I will, instead of not my will, but thy will, we've messed up. Because it's not about our will. It's not about acquiring power. See, some people get the wrong impression that, you know, God is a vending machine. And if we serve Him, then He's going to give us power. And I'm going to get all the things I want. You see? Now, does God... Absolutely, He's going to bless you. As you acquire His nature, He will trust you with more of His power. Amen. It's like having a, a teenage kid. If you have a teenage kid, you 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 don't, you know, there are certain things you can't trust that kid with until you are sure that he has enough maturity and his nature is such that you can trust him with the keys to the car or whatever the whatever it may be. And and, and see, beloved, God is no different. He is not going to trust us with His power until we first acquire His nature. Hmm. Does that make sense? So we find this, 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 this Lucifer sliding into the garden as a serpent. And he comes over to, to Adam female and he says, Hey, guess what? If you take of that tree, you'll be like God. Like God. In His power? Was He appealing to the power or the nature of God? The power. You'll be as God knowing both good and evil. You'll have the power. You see, and this is, this is what separates us from the, the, the witchcraft field out there. We have power in the name of Jesus. We have power as we are submitted under His authority. Yes, God gives us power. But see, witchcraft wants to have power without submitting to the nature of God. That's the whole, that's the whole thing right there. And so mankind has inherited 
this lie from our first parents that we want to be like God, but we don't like His nature. At least our flesh doesn't. He, we want to, we we it, we resist the nature, but we want to acquire the power. You see, but God is going. What He is doing in these days is He is growing up sons and daughters. He is growing up a bride that is going to have His nature. Somebody who has a like nature to you. You know, someone who is similar. Some people say opposites attract. Oh, no, they don't. <laughs> Maybe in some things. But if you've been married very long, <laughs> you want somebody who kind of sees things the way you see them, has the same worldview, has the same values as you do, has all the, the, the you know, there's got to be at least some similarities, at least a, to a large degree, of you and your potential spouse having the same nature. Amen. Now Jesus wants a bride that's going to have his nature. You see that was the whole that was the whole thing with the disciples. Their whole thing was, okay, Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? You're going to get rid of the Romans? Get them off our backs so we can have 12 thrones and we can rule and reign and call fire down from heaven. And Jesus like, you don't even know what you're talking about. He said, you don't even know what kind of spirit you have. Because they were seeking for power and not seeking for His nature. I hope I'm making some sense tonight. Amen. Praise God forevermore. Thank you, Jesus. In another place, the Bible tells us that they they tried to they want they had planned to take Jesus to force him to be king, and he just kind of went and hid himself and got away. Why? Because he came to deliver to us and to bring us his nature and to walk in his path, uh, an inner path, not a path of outward authority to have the nature first. And I'm not saying we won't have authority. I'm not saying that we do not have and are not given authority by God. What I am saying is the greater His nature lives within us, the more, the, the, you know, I must decrease and He must increase. And the more I get Gus O'Haran out of the way, the more of Jesus I can have ruling and reigning in my life. And therefore, then, God can trust me with His power because I have His nature. What was the whole fight at the cross? If you be the Son of God, come down from that cross. We'll believe you if you show us your power. We'll believe you, ma'am. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You will believe you if you display your power. And he told he 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 said to Pilate, he said, "Do you not think that I could have my father bring ten thousand? I could have it right now." He says, "But for this cause came I to this hour." He was there to display his nature as that of a lamb. Uh, as he said, as a sheep before her shears is dumb, as a lamp, he opened not his mouth. He was displaying his nature for us. But the next time he comes, he's going to display his power. Ha ha ha. Hallelujah. So it's a principle that I'm trying to drive home to you because as we study the tabernacle, we want to think, how can this that I'm studying, how is it a picture of His nature? How can I acquire His nature? Where am I not like Him? Where do I not have His nature? And how can I then acquire that nature? Because the more I grow in Him, the more I take on of His nature, then the more power I can be trusted with. 
to the place where, like in the book of Acts, the dead truly are being raised as a matter of just routine. The, the lame are walking, the blind are seeing. Like Peter walked by and in just his shadow came down and healed people. Beloved, God is growing us up. He is bringing us as sons into glory. You see, Paul said in Galatians, the fourth chapter, he says, the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant. Amen. So until we have his nature, then we, we can't be trusted with his power. Let's go to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse uh, 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. There's only one perfect man that I know of, and that's Jesus. So he is he has dedicated the fivefold ministry to minister to us. He says, first of all, uh, for the for the perfecting of the saints. We are saints. Did y'all know that? But we still need perfecting. <laughs> the saints. I've met a few saints. They were saints. God bless their precious hearts, but they needed perfecting. <laughs> and, and, and I can include myself in that. You know, the, just because you're a saint, just because you're saved, doesn't mean you're perfect yet. And so there is a growth process. There is a growing in God as we grow in His nature. Oh, hallelujah. As we grow deeper and lay aside ourselves and deny our flesh and deny ourselves and humble ourselves before Him and learn the lessons of every situation that God allows to come into our lives, as we then are transformed, we then grow in His nature and then can be trusted with greater degrees and greater levels of His power. Amen. Hallelujah. He says, unto a perfect man, listen to this, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So He says there, there is a measure Metron in the Greek. And the word measure is metron, and it means a graduated staff for measuring, like a ruler. One, two, three, four, five. And as we grow up in stature, and I told you last week, the Lord Jesus, He is the measuring stick. And we are to grow in the measure in the to the fullness of the stature of Christ. Now, I don't know of any place in the Word of God where the stature of Christ is more fully measured out than in the Old Testament tabernacle. Where, where the intricacies and the details of His nature, the beauty of His holiness, is more fully displayed than in the Old Testament tabernacle. To 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, and verse 18. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. And he says here, he says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So what's he saying? The more we behold Him, the more we are changed. The more we look into His beauty, then we, are, we, we see Him reflected and we see who we are not by comparing ourselves to Him. But you know what? We also see who we are. <laughs> we also can see who we are. 
Amen. Was it in the book of James, he said that as we look into the Word, we look into the mirror of the Word of God. Something to that effect. I know I'm not quoting it exactly. <clears throat> but we look into the mirror. He said, when we go away and we forget what manner of man we were. Not only do we forget sometimes what our faults are and where we need to repent and say, Lord, I need more of your nature in this area to help me with my temper, with my unforgiveness, with whatever whatever it may be. Help me, Father, because I've looked into Your Word and I've seen where I'm falling short. But you know what? We also look into His, into his, his mirror and we see how our Father has been working to make us more like Him. And, and, and we, we look and we say, wow. I see some progress there. I'm growing up. I'm becoming like my big brother, Jesus. I'm becoming like my father as we grow, as we behold. So tonight, we're going to behold for a little while this tabernacle. And, and, and as we behold Him here at the gate, I was praying today, I was like, Lord, where should I start? Where should I start? You know, I could have started anywhere in any, any place. And the Lord just told me, He said, I want you to go to the gate. Just go to the gate and start right there at that door. Begin at the beginning. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So let's go to Exodus, the 27th chapter and verse 16. Now, let me, just by way of review, refresh your memory just a little bit. This, this tabernacle was uh, the first thing you would have seen when you came to this tabernacle in the wilderness is you would have seen a fence that went around the entire tabernacle complex. It was a big white, it was made of white linen, and it was a little higher than eye level. And it encompassed the entire, the entire tabernacle complex, if we, if we can use that word. And then within there, there was a tent. This was called the actual, the tabernacle or the tent of the congregation. It was also called the tent of meeting. Amen. And someday I'd like to study with you the different words that God used to describe it. Why tabernacle of the congregation? Why tent of meeting? One of the reasons is because God promised. He says, when you go there, I will meet you there. <laughs> Whew, hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. And then... <clears throat> This tent had a partition here, and, and, it, and so it was divided into three main sections. C, down here for courtyard. Uh, H, P, for holy place, which is this area right here. And then I'll put H, H, for holy of holies. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So there is, again, the, these different realms. He's showing us these different realms and levels of access. Whew, hallelujah. As we come into the presence of God, the personal presence where the glory dwelt between those cherubims, there was a way made. Oh, hallelujah. And see, we learned last week as we were, we were studying, um, <clears throat> how many of you remember how we learned how that when God began to lay out the furniture of this tabernacle, Exodus 40, Exodus 40, we were there last week, God started with Himself in the Holy of Holies. And then He reached out and put a table of showbread over here 
Might as well draw it while I'm here. So he started here. With the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat up here in the Holy of Holies. He said he, he, he put a table. The Bible tells us that he put a table over on the north side here. This was north. And then he says he came over here and he put a candlestick. Ooh, hallelujah. Candlestick. With 66, interestingly enough, and one day we'll 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 we'll, we'll count these up because I like going into the details. We'll count up the bowls, knots, and flowers on this candlestick. You will find there were sixty six of them. Hmm. A picture of the light of the word. The sixty six books of your Bible, which supported seven lamps up at the top. Seven is the number of completion. It, it shows complete light. The complete light of the Word of God. Amen. <laughs> now, I can't see light, but light enables me to see everything else in this room. You see, this Word is light. And it is the light or the filter through which you can see everything else in your life, in others' lives, in, in every situation. See, the deep, again, nature. When you go deeper in the Word and you learn more of His nature, He can trust you with more of His power, His wisdom, His understanding, His knowledge to reach out into someone's life who may be struggling and say, you know what, because of the Word of God uh, that's burning in my heart, then I have a deeper prophetic word for you. I have something to give to you. I have something to impart. But there were 66 bowls, knops, and flowers in that candlestick. Seven lamps of complete light. Exodus 40, he said, I'm going to put a golden altar right here in the center between the table of showbread and the candlestick. And then he came down and he said, I'm going to build right here at the gate. I'm going to put a brazen altar. Incidentally, the brazen altar was the largest piece of furniture in the tabernacle. It was the largest. You know why? Because God was emphasizing the blood, the sacrifice. And our, in other words, he said, when you come in this gate, you don't go past, you don't go any further until you stop at this altar. Hallelujah. And they would offer a sacrifice of animal, animal blood. No, we don't offer a sacrifice of animal blood. Our sacrifice has been given once and for all. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Hmm. Hallelujah. So, so, so the blood was right there. The first thing when they walked in, understand, let's say there's a, I'll draw it down here, a little Israelite down here. I'll try to draw a little stick figure. There he is. Y'all see him? He's just inside the gate. Now, he, he's out here, but he wants to have a relationship with a holy God who dwells in here. So how is this little one going to come in here and have a relationship with an infinitely holy being? Huh. He can't unless he comes through each of these seven pieces of furniture to come in. On the Day of Atonement, the priest had to go by every one of these and sprinkle blood on each one of them and sanctify every piece of furniture before he could then enter into the Holy of Holies. You see, so what I'm trying to say is every one of these pieces of furniture is an experience in God that we have 
as we are making our way back home, like a salmon swimming upstream. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. What was our first experience when we got uh, when we got saved? How did we get saved? The blood. Yes. What was the first experience the little Israelite who's wanting to relate to this holy God up here? He couldn't do it. The first thing, blood. Blood. The sacrifice of the, the, the supreme sacrifice of Calvary. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And then, the last piece of furniture, he put a laver, the Bible tells us, right in between the tent and the altar. Now, what do you see in the arrangement of those seven pieces of furniture? God was showing us. He's making a picture. He's making a demonstration to us that if you want to go into relationship with a holy God. You want His nature and, and, to, to find, and to have His power. Then you've got to go through the cross. There is no other way but through the cross. No other legitimate way, I might say. Huh. Jesus did say over in John, He said, that He that climbs up some other way. In other words, it is possible to climb up another way. But woe unto you if you climb up another way. You see, this, this is so powerful. This courtyard was all about access. How to gain access. This holy place, when you come to the holy place, you think intimacy. Intimacy. By feeding on the Word, the bread of life. Intimacy. By burning the fragrance on the altar of incense, which was a picture of prayer. He said over in the book of Revelation, that incense is the prayers of saints. So this is an experience that we have at His heart. This is, this is the, the, the experience of prayer that Paul spoke about when he said over in Romans 8, he said, the Spirit helps our infirmities because we don't know how to pray as we ought. He said, but the Spirit helps our infirmities with groanings which cannot be uttered. Has anybody here ever groaned in prayer? Sometimes you had such a heavy burden, you just, oh. And there was that groaning. You see, when you yield to that groaning in the Spirit, what is happening is the Spirit is helping your weakness. <laughs> it is helping your infirmity. And a fragrance is being released. Whew. Ah, hallelujah. And then we find intimacy through walking by the light of the 66 books of your Bible, the 66 bowls, knots, and flowers, the complete light. The, he, the more we walk with Him, the more light we see. David said over in the Psalms, he said, in thy light shall we see light. So what he meant was, the more light I see, the more light I am able to see. And then I can, when I see that, then I see more. And the more I see, the more I see. And, 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 and it continues to just unfold. But you see, here, there was, on, there, there was light in this courtyard. The light came from the sun. But here, in the holy place, the only light in there was the light of the candlestick. The light of the Word. You see, you can have access down here and walk by natural light. Just so I think this, this is what I think. This is my opinion. This is neat. But if you want intimacy in the holy place, you've got to quit walking by what you think and what you feel. In the holy place, you walk by the light of the Word. You must walk by the light of the Word. And then the holy of holies 
is all about authority. This is where the authority came from. As we continue to study, I want to tell you, I want to show you how that the high priest would wear his garments, the garments of beauty, a picture of Jesus, our high priest, and he would wear a breastplate. And in order to, when they had a question, they had a question of, should we go out to war? Or should, uh, uh, in one case, there was a man who had left only daughters and had no sons, and they're like, hey, we want our father's inheritance. So the Bible says that they went and they asked the priest. They would go in these matters that were like very difficult for them to understand. They would go to the priest. See, when <laughs> it's a lesson for us. When we don't know what to do, you know, d d go ask the high priest. Get on your knees. Get on your face. And say, God, I'm not letting go until you, until I hear from you, until you speak to me. And so they would go to the priest. And the priest would come in to the holy place, and he would stand between the veil and the golden altar. So he would have the veil in front of him, and inside that veil was the Ark of the Covenant, and behind him was the golden altar. What is that a picture of? Look, if you're going to seek God's mind, it needs to be supported and backed up by a prayer life. Come on. I'm t the, the pictures here are... I'm telling you guys, I haven't even scratched the surface of what we're going to be going into in this tabernacle. It, it is absolutely mind-expanding. Hallelujah. So here we go. Intimacy. But in other words, when they wanted to know what God wanted them to do, should we march? Should we go to war? Who shall go out first? They would always go to the priest, and the priest would ask the question before the Ark of the Covenant. And there would be a flashing. When the Lord spoke, there would be a flashing in the breastplate. Two little stones that the Bible talks about called the Urim and the Tumim. Huh. were tucked inside. Urim and Tumim. And they were to, they would flash and they would know God spoke. That's how we know God spoke. And I think it's funny. I, can, I, can I just, I see this happening here. And I, I understand I'm new here. I haven't been here very long. So I've seen this happening here at Bethel. I'll see people go, oh, you know, and, you know, do this number, right? You know, and I was, I was in, we went to fire starters. And man, I mean, they were just, oh boy, you talk about on fire. They were, you know, and that lady was up there. Tiz is her name, powerful woman of God. And she was just preaching and, and she, oh, and she'd keep preaching, oh. And, and, and people think, well, that's foolishness. What is that? Oh, no, it's not. That's 100% scriptural. Because what that is, is the new... T I feel... The whoosh. Whoosh. Mm. That is the New Testament fulfillment of the type and shadow in the Old Testament. Because we are kings and priests, so we have a breastplate. <laughs> and when we speak to the Lord in prayer, a lot of times you'll feel that little leap in your... In your... <sighs> yeah. You think, well, what is that? That's the Holy Ghost. That's the Spirit bearing witness to the truth. You feel that leap inside of you. Authority. But see, the problem with many of us, until we learn better, let's say all of us, until we learn better, is that we're down here trying to get access and rather than worried about the access through the blood and the fire and the water, amen, that was here, then we, we, we're more preoccupied with, I want some authority. And God's like, you're not ready for authority yet, little one. You're not ready. You need to grow in my nature. You need to become a slain lamb. 
You need to have that nature of humility, that nature of love. You see, because if God trusted us with power, well, I can tell you right now what I would have done. There's a lot of people I would have called fire down from heaven and just burned them up. But right? I would have been like, you're done. You're done. But God's not trusting us with that kind of power. He wants to. In one place, He told His disciples, He says, whosoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven. Whosoever sins you don't forgive, they're not forgiven. In other words, he's, He wants to give us that kind of authority where we have the power to forgive sin. Now that's Bible, okay? But you know what? <laughs> I, I'm just Let's just talk about me. Forgiveness has been one of the biggest struggles in my life. Uh, you know, had, if I had that kind of authority, then there would be a lot of, be, a lot of people that would be unforgiven. But God's like, I'm not trusting you with that kind of authority. I'm talking about me. He's not trusting me with that kind of authority yet until I have His nature that will forgive and love no matter what. Right, Exodus 27. Let's, let's, let's go to the tabernacle. Exodus 27, verse 16. And for the gate of the court shall be an hanging of twenty cubits of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen wrought with needlework, and their pillars shall be four, and their sockets four. Now, the very first thing when they came in, I won't erase it, right here, there was a hanging across here, right in front of the brazen altar. There was a hanging for the gate of that tabernacle. Before they went in, before they even saw the lamb on the altar, before they saw the water in that labor, before they saw the fire on the altar, before they saw any of this, he said, there's a gate there. And, and that gate, it, it, the word is so powerful. It is, the word is sha'ar in the Hebrew. And sha'ar means, one of the meanings is to think. It means to split open, to provide access. It means to think or to meditate. In other words, when you think on something, you kind of open it up. You open it up for further inspection. You open it up to see a little deeper inside. And so this gate was for... It, 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 the word literally means in Hebrew, shoar, it means to think. Huh. So God was saying, now when you come in up to, up to the gate, you haven't even gone into the courtyard yet. When you come to the gate, stop, think, consider meditate for a moment. And let's see what he wanted them to think on. What did he want them to what did he want them to look at? There were four colors that he used. He used four threads, four colors of thread. Blue, purple, scarlet and white linen. Now, each one of these is a picture of our Jesus. This, these four colors. He said when you stop, you think, you meditate, you, you look at this curtain, at this gate, with these four colors, so powerful. Now, first, it, it, the word, it was the blue. Now, the blue is, amen, make yourself comfortable. Now, blue uh, comes from, uh, the word blue in Hebrew is, is techelet. And techelet blue is a very special kind of blue that comes 
from the shell of a certain kind of oyster, 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 that that lives over in the, that part of the world. And what they would do is they would open it up, and when they would crush it, then it would emit, this oyster would emit this blue dye. You see? And, 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 and in other words, you know, God is showing us the depths of His love. They had to go deep in order to get this blue to make this tabernacle. Yeah. And, and, and incidentally, think about this with me for a second. Look at all, if you think about all of the gold and the silver and the bronze and the acacia wood and all of the fine things that were used to make this tabernacle. The, the, uh, I heard someone say recently that you know, it would have been at least somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 40 million dollars in today's money with what you know, the, the value was there. These people were slaves. They had just been making bricks. Where did they get all this gold and silver? And... Huh? Well, they gave it to them and they just left. You got it. They spo- the Bible says they spoiled the Egyptians. In under- other words, the Egyptians paid them. They went out of there with all of this wealth, all of these riches. You see, understand, when God's got you in a place of affliction, <laughs> and you think, I'm just making bricks for nothing, God's like, oh no, <laughs> I'm not going to owe you anything. <laughs> I'm piling up. He's piling up riches all of the riches that you're going to need because He's going to deliver you from that. And He was going to use all those riches to make and to build the stature of Christ. Isn't that powerful? <laughs> Praise God forevermore. Amen. So the blue, you know, the ocean is blue and the sky is blue. So it speaks to us of the heights of the love of Jesus. He said in one place, how high did his love go? He said in Hebrews, he said he went beyond the heavens. Beyond the heavens. Now we know and we can prove there's at least three heavens in Scripture. Possibly more, but I can prove three. But he said he went beyond that. So what's out there? What's beyond the heavens? I'll tell you what, it's infinity. The Father's infinity. In other words, His love goes through the heavens and goes into infinity. <clears throat> His love brought Him so deep that He went to the lowest hell for you and for me in our place. The depths of His love. So think. He, now when they came to this gate, they were confronted with this beautiful tapestry of blue. What is the message of the blue? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So if He said blue, there's a a message in the blue. You all see that? There's a message in the blue. The blue, meditate, think on how far His love went for me. How deep it went. How high it goes. It's deeper than than any of my sin, and it's higher than all of my pride. His love. Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Oh, hallelujah. And then he said, Stop. Consider purple. Everybody knows that purple is the color of royalty. Been that way since time immemorial. Think about the ruling power. He said, he said, the Apostle Paul said that he will rule until he puts all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. My Jesus, my Savior, through his sacrifice on Calvary, will rule in every situation, rule in every circumstance of my life, 
Everywhere I have fallen down, everywhere I have made mistakes, everywhere uh, you know others have done me wrong, He rules and He reigns as a King, supreme in His authority. Praise Him for that. Think on that. Meditate on that. And then, there was another color here called scarlet. Now scarlet, oh, you're going to love this one. Scarlet means, the word is tolaw in the Hebrew. And it means, and you can look it up, it's in your Strong's Concordance, it means a maggot. <laughs> maggot, M-A-G-G-O-T, maggot. It is the most repulsive. A mag I can't think of anything worse than a maggot. There's nothing so repulsive as a maggot. So what they would do is they would take these maggots and they would crush them. And again, they would emit this red dye that when, when they crushed them, they would burst open with a red colored dye that they would use to stain the threads for this tabernacle. Now remember, all of this is a picture of Jesus. It's all portraying Him. Huh. So how did Jesus become a worm? Well, that's, let's go over to Psalms 22 and verse 6. Psalms 22, verse 6. He says, and this is a prophetic psalm about Jesus on the cross here. He says, but I am a worm and no man a reproach of men, despised of the people. Huh. Gee, and the word for worm there is tola. It's maggot. I am a, it would be a more accurate translation, is I am a maggot. Not only a worm, but the most repulsive of worms. The, the, this scarlet speaks of the humility of the Lord Jesus how deep His humility went. He said, He who knew no sin became sin that we might be the righteousness of God in Him. Now that's powerful. Because, see, it takes a special kind of humility to become a worm and to become the, the, you know, how do we feel? You know, Jesus took our sin. He took our blame, right? So how do I feel? How do I react when I'm being blamed for something I know wasn't my fault? See how far we are from His nature? We got to, as we meditate on this, we can see, Lord, Lord, I see your nature, but I see <laughs> my nature. Lord, I want your nature. I want your scarlet humility. The humility of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And then, the last one was white linen. Fine white linen. Now the Bible tells us, over in Revelation, the 19th chapter, let me, I'll give you the Scripture. Revelation 19.8. What is fine linen? Somebody got Revelation 19.8? Say it, darling. The righteousness of saints. Fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So this was the righteousness, His righteousness. But you see, the Bible tells us how we, how we get white linen. How do we get linen? The same way Abraham did. The Bible says that he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. The more I believe in him, oh, Lord, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I believe in you. I don't know how I'm, I'm ever going to get through this, but Lord, I'm trusting you. Every time I trust him, every time I believe him, he starts spinning the linen factory. And the linen factory turns on and he starts weaving this fine linen. 
That's what the bride is going to wear. That's her wedding dress. She got that wedding dress spun by believing on Him. Isn't that powerful, Calvin? Believing on Him. So every time I come to this gate, the, the word means to, to think, to meditate, to, to consider. They were to consider before even going in the depths of the love of our Savior. The royal, the reigning authority in His power over every situation and circumstance. The humility in which He was willing to become the most repulsive of creatures for me. And the white linen of His righteousness as I believe on Him. And I'm going to close. Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. And verse 7. He says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And the word there for thinketh is the same Hebrew word for gate. The same word. Shoar. The same word for gate is the same word for think. Now think about that. And he says, as you think in your heart, so are you. So in other words, what's the message? As we think on these things, as we meditate on this gate, the, this blue, this purple, this scarlet, this white linen, then we become transformed. We become changed. As we behold Him, we change from glory to glory. We are transformed into the same image so that we can take on greater levels of His nature. And therefore then, God can trust us with His power.